Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 151, Filling the Cube. One Kallax Cube worth of family games. I'm Sean, and with me as always, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. This episode is sponsored by Crowd Games. After the show, take some time to check out City of the Great Machine on Kickstarter. This one-verse mini steampunk-themed board game has already crushed their funding goal and features some great steampunk artwork and miniatures as well as top-notch components. Some previewers are already calling it one of the best one-verse mini hidden movement games of all time. I'll be sure to drop a link that in our show notes and down below. So this week, we've got a question from one of our biggest fans, our first Patreon patron who's looking to fill their gaming shelf with some new games. And we're going to see what we can fit into one Calyx cube with a focus on games for the entire family. After that, we'll be offering up a mostly spoiler-free review. Don't worry, we'll put all the spoilers at the very end of Emergence of Shy Pluto, the, what do they call it? The Saga, that's the term, Saga expansion for Space Base, the story expansion, uh, which is now part one of two. Uh, we'll give you lots of warning when we're going to get to spoil things so you can actually skip ahead or whatever you need to do. Finally, we've got some actual physical gameplays to talk about in our Bellhops tabletop segment. It's been a while. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Let's start off with a comment from Jeff Lai, the designer of Draconis Invasion, who checked out our RAF coverage. I enjoyed reading the review just now. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Well, thanks for checking it out, Jeff. Uh, I gotta admit, I was a bit concerned when Jeff told me he was reading the review because we weren't totally positive in our critique, um, mainly due to that promo card issue. I'm sure you remember if you did see that review or, or read it on the blog. I'm glad he didn't take it personally. Now, I do still hope there was enough time to get something in there before the retail release hits, which uh, as far as I know, still hasn't happened. I see it's still up for pre-order on the Draconis Invasion website, but I haven't personally seen it show up on any of the online stores yet. Well, next, a comment about our Brunch with the Bellhop Sunday live shows from longtime fan of the show, Red Meeple Ryan. Someday, I want you to appear on a brunch show where you appear to be burned out as if having worked a long weekend conference dealing with rude guests and absurd requests with no dings left to give. <laughs> well, I don't think that's going to happen, um, though I know I have shown up to that show rather burnt out before. And I have gone off on a couple rants. I don't plan on ever turning our content uh, there on this show or on that one with yet another, oh, this is my hot take, my rant, my negative vibe, my here's my real thoughts on. That's just not our thing. And while it's just not me, while I admit we can be quite critical, I still enjoy talking about what we love over things we hate. Well, next up, a really quick comment on our topic of games for grade school. Victor Sintor writes, nice topic. <laughs> you know, that wasn't a spam comment. I had to check and I'm like, no, no, looking at what they watch, they're, they're a gamer. So I chose to keep it. Thanks, Victor. Um, I actually thought that was a, a fun and worthwhile topic myself. So I'm glad to see people are discovering it. And I got to say, I appreciate comments, even that simple, right? Just by doing that. YouTube's like, oh, people are commenting on this. We're going to show this to more people to see if they comment. So even though all he had to say was th nice topic, I still appreciate it. All right. Well, next up, more coffee on Twitter commented on our Concordia unboxing video to say, still really unsure if I should get it or not. Concordia is just such a solid experience. Thank you for the video. Well, thanks for the comment. More coffee. I'll let you know what I think once we actually get it to the table, which I was hoping was going to happen over the last three weeks, but didn't for uh, reasons everyone should be aware of at this point. Now, this conversation actually went on a bit, went back and forth, which I love it when that happens on YouTube, too. When someone comments, I reply, they reply to me, and it becomes a whole conversation. And what more coffee is actually most worried about is that the game will become scripted, that there will be a 
sim similar opening every time you go play the game when you use salsa. So the big thing salsa adds to Concordia is salt, which is a wild resource. And based on playing lots of games of Concordia, no, more coffee's thinking, well, the salt's gonna be too good. It, it, it's worth too much. So every game when playing with salsa is gonna be the rush to the salt. Who's can get the salt first? And I gotta admit, yeah, that could be right. That that could very well become the new intro to Concordia. Kind of like now, it's kind of the rush for silk. Though silk's not that much better than the resource below it, but it is enough that there is usually a silk rush at the start of the game. Well, hopefully I'll be able to find out for sure by actually getting the game to the table. Um, I don't think that'll happen in the next week, but sometime soon. All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming and game night questions. Today's question comes from longtime fan of our show and first ever Patreon patron, Brian Kurtz. Brian writes, Hi, Mo, Sean, and Deanna. I've been catching up on a few weeks' worth of episodes and posts that I missed, so games in your show and blog have been on my mind. Nice. I always love reading and listening to the bellhop. I apologize if my question is something you've already covered in a similar episode and post if I've missed it, but I want to talk space. No, not whether Terraforming Mars or Twilight Imperium is better for a particular gaming group. I mean the size of my game closet footprint. I'd like to pick up some games that are new to me, but I want to do so unobtrusively so that I don't have to earmark new space for it. If you had a defined space, say something like 12 inch or 18 inch cube, that you wanted to stay within, what games would earn their place in that limited space? Bonus points if you have some family games, say appropriate for age 10 plus, within your list, as that is a consideration with me. While I wouldn't say money is no object, assume, for the sake of this question, that space is more precious than money. Oh, thanks for the rather interesting question, and of course your longtime support there, Brian. Always great to hear from Brian. Now, I thought this would be a fun thought experience to go through, and I did think of one thing I do want to tweak, though, in Brian's question. So Brian is looking for a 12 inch or 18 inch cube. I have to assume however his closet's organized, he has cubes of two different sizes, which is, is, is a pretty good size to work with. But I thought this question would be more universal and useful to more people if we actually change that amount to be the exact space of one Calyx cube. Now, for those that don't know what I mean by a Calyx cube, Calyx is a style of shelving unit sold by IKEA that features cubes, cube-sized storage spaces arranged in a grid. You can buy a shelving unit of one cube, or you can buy a five cube by five cube big at the biggest and everything in between. You can also just get like rectangular towers as well. And the neat thing about these is they can be stored any way. So you can take like a four long one and put it next to another one, or you can lay it on its side. Now, these are also designed to be able to stack and can be easily added to by just being more cubes. Now, in addition to the cube size storage space, you can also get upgrades like bins that fit into the cubes, doors, glass windows, etc. Though most gamers just tend to stick with the basic Calyx. Now, the reason I call out the specific shelving unit that in the last few years, it has become the go-to storage suggestion for tabletop gamers the world over. Every time you see anyone saying, I'm a new gamer and I want a new way to store my shelves, how should I do it? There's going to be a number of people jumping up to say, you got to get a Calyx, you got to go to Ikea. Now, this is for good reasons. First off is price. Ikea makes really solid furniture for a very reasonable price. The second is that your standard board game box, that ticket to ride size box, fits perfectly in a single Calyx cube without rubbing on the edges. Now, most modern board games are about 12 inches wide, but not over 13, and that fits perfect. And at Calyx is 13 by 13 by 15 size without rubbing, plus allowing for deeper, longer boxes that don't stick out the front. So that's the size we're going to work with today. And we do apologize for all those listeners out there who have absolutely no idea what a Calyx is and have never stepped into an Ikea. Yes. Because while many people sort of assume the, the, the concept of Ikea is very universal and everyone knows about Ikea and everyone knows all the memes and tropes about Ikea, there's actually a significant number of places that don't have Ikeas, uh, yeah. even places as big as like Buffalo, New York, 
uh, the, the closest Ikea to them is actually by my house in Hamilton, <laughs> Ontario. And to be honest, the closest Ikea to me right now is also in Hamilton, Ontario, though we do have a new one coming to Devonshire Mall, which I'm hoping is going to be one of the big walkthrough ones. Because what we used to have before was like the mail order, the consumer's version of Ikea, where you could go through and look through a digital catalog and then they'll deliver stuff there and you can pick it up. Which is how we got ours. Nobody listening to this show understands what consumers distributing is. Oh, come on. There's <laughs> got to be some old ground yards out there that know what consumers is. <laughs> Oh. They, they they bought GI Joes there or Transformers or something. That's that's where our parents did the grow did the uh, the holiday shopping for the most part with yeah. consumers distributing. The first thing I ever bought on my own was from consumers distributing, and it was the mask condor, which was the green helicopter yeah. flash bike. That was the first thing I bought with my own money, my own allowance, and it came from consumers. And consumers is the reason that I knew my postal code back in grade <laughs> school because you had to fill it out on the forms. So yeah, what I'll do is in the show notes for anyone who doesn't know what it is, uh, I will drop a link to the Calax page on Ikea. And technically before they were the Calax, they were the Expedit. So before it was the Expedit and the Expedit upgraded. So before the Calax, people were like, you got to buy an Expedit, whatever that is. So what I did was I filled the shelf. We, we owned Calax Cubes interestingly we don't keep games in them normally so the this is what we per picked up in that short window that you, there was an ikea pickup store in windsor we bought them for the kids toys so the kids have a, a playroom i guess it's our front room but it's where, where they spend a lot of time playing with the toys we bought it to organize their toys and art supplies and other kids stuff so what i did was i actually stole my kids one of my kids calyx shelves i had them empty it out and i brought it in here and we built a shelf of games so what I stuck with is games I already own because I wanted to be able to try it and fit a shelf. And I think these are all games Brian and his family will love. I did stick to the family friendly games. So he said bonus for family friendly games. Everything on my shelf is family friendly or plays at least a wide age range. Now there is one exclusion that I feel I need to mention that I did not fit on my shelf and that's on purpose. And that is ghost fight and treasure hunters. Because anytime anyone says family friendly game, I can play with it with kids, I think Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunt. The thing is, I recommended this game to Brian five years ago or whatever, when back on Google Plus, and he went out and bought it then and thanked me for it. And I think that's one of the reasons that he even follows us now is for, for my recommendation of that game. So he already owns that. So he already owns Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. So I did not put that on my list. Fair enough. So here's what I managed to fit. I started with the Quacks of Quedlinburg, the pusher lock bag builder that we just reviewed last week. Everyone in our family loves this game. All the kids were easily able to pick it up. Everyone I've shown this game loves it. Just check out our review last week for more info. Next, I put in Azul Summer Pavilion. Now, this is my personal favorite version of Azul. It is a bit heavier than the original, so you want older kids for this one, right? Like you said, 10 plus, so you're not talking six, seven-year-olds. Um, I personally think... Summer Pavilion is going to be more appealing to the gamers, like to Brian himself, the adults playing, and then any other gamers. So I went with that one. Technically, swap that out for your Azul of choice. Next, I have Garinto. Now, we've mentioned this one many times before, and for good reason. This is one of the best abstract games we've ever played. Rules are simple enough. Even kids can get the basics, though strategy might take a bit longer. Next, I've got Gizmos, uh, which for a while we were really talking about talking up on the show all the time, mainly because we were at the public events and I was really into the game. This is a great gateway engine builder where you're building Gizmos for the science fair using a unique marble based power dispenser system, which kids love playing with the power dispenser. Then I managed to squeeze in Space Base. While I will say this problem is probably not great for young kids, especially with the charge cubes and some of the interactions. Again, we're talking 10 plus or older, so it's going to depend on your kids and their, and their comfort level. Space Base can be great for the whole family as long as they pick it up. The other bonus this one has over the other ones is it does play up to five players, with even more if you pick up some of the expansion. This is one of those games that's great for a family because it keeps everyone interested every turn, so the younger players don't get bored. Next, I've got Bean. We love Bonanza. We've recommended it a million times. Works great with players of all gaming experience. As Sean talked about before, you can take it as serious as you want, which I think fits great for this game. I've had this one for years, and to be honest, this is probably the oldest game I have that still sees play regularly. It even beats out Catan in this house and Carcassonne. We play Bean way more than either of those, and they're in the same age group. 
Next, I managed to squeeze in a copy of The Fox in the Forest. This one I threw in there for when there's only two of you and you want to play a game. We love this two-player trick-taking game. As long as the kids or the non-experienced gamers know how trick-taking works, which most people do from playing traditional cards, you're good to go. And if you don't, the rules do explain trick-taking if you don't. And finally, when I was done with everything else, I had this small hole just the size of a deck of playing cards. Now, my first thought was grab a deck of playing cards and shove it in there, which I think fits. But you know what? I don't think people expect me to recommend playing card games. And plus, you probably got those in a drawer somewhere. You don't need them on your Calyx. So what I grabbed is a game called Cypher. This is one of the Love Letter clones. I don't know if it's 18 cards, but it's one of those small amount of cards in a cloth bag. It has the name of the game on it. And it's one of my favorite of all the ones I played. It's a cyberpunk themed game where you're playing cards from three different factions vying for control of the Nexus. Fair enough. Uh, I went a little more uh, uh, vague and, 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 and less densely packed, partially because I don't own a Kylax, but I also don't own the vast number of games to Jenga things in. Yes. Uh, and while all of the board game sizes are available on Board Game Geek, it takes a few clicks to get to them mm -hmm. and uh, it, it takes some effort. So what I went with is, all right, you want family games. Well, let's see how many of the top family games I can throw into one Calax. I think now, that's awesome. one of them you can't fit in at all because for some reason in the top 10 uh, family games, Crokinole is right there. Uh, <laughs> and you're not fitting that one into a Calax mm -hmm. any way you play. But... A real fun, easy way is Wingspan, which is, you know, everyone's favorite uh, family game these days. Quacks, uh, you know, right along there with uh, the Bellhop. Azul, again, I went with the basic, not the not the uh, advanced, but, you know, pick your favorite version of Azul. Uh, Clank, because, well, I love Clank, but it also is one of the top 10 family games. And Lost Ruins of Arnak, which is a bigger one, but fits nicely on the bottom of the uh, of the stack to uh, basically take up all the space you've got. You've got a little bit of room on the top, maybe a little bit of room for some cards on the sides, but uh, makes for a nice, neat uh, descending stack of games. That is awesome. I have to commend Sean for that one, putting that one together, looking up the family games and figuring it out. I'm like, I almost figured, I was like, I don't know, am I just going to do all the talking? And Sean's like, I don't know, no Calax. <laughs> have fun, Mo. No, this is, it's awesome. I want to see these games in a Calax. So if anyone owns these and has a Calax, take a picture. I was I actually, I, I almost, I almost started Photoshop. opening up Blender and, yeah. and 3D rendering some game boxes. But I, I, my days are just too busy to actually do yeah, that. Yeah, so, right so I should have given you a week's notice. And then <laughs> Sean would have had it all maxed out and figured out mathematically with a spreadsheet. And like, here is the maximum number of games you can get in a 13 by 13 by 15 cube. There you go. So once I finished my cube, right, the kids are like, what are you doing? Why, why, why did you move our shelves? Why do you need our shelves, right? So they decided they wanted to jump in. And I got to say, they did a pretty good job themselves. So my kids, this is my kids' Calyx cube. So Brian, uh, from my kids to your kids. Um, so the first one they started with was The Little Prince, Rising to the Stars, a card-driven race game with fantastic artwork based on the new Little Prince movie. Fun Fair, a game I totally wanted on my shelf, but oh, good games publishing. It's two millimeters bigger than Gizmos and Garinto and Azul and Space Base. It's just like, oh, it just doesn't fit. So it didn't go on my shelf, so they got to keep that one. So they, they got uh, Fun Fair. Then King Me, which is a gamer's version of Checkers or Drafts. Oh, Foxed, a deduction game for kids. Now, this one I tried to talk them out of because it's really a kid's game. I don't know how much parents would enjoy this one. But it's their shelf, not mine. Then Woodlands, which is a very cool path-building game that uses transparent overlays to really good effect. And Rhino Hero because, of course, Rhino Hero. And then Star Wars Destiny, which is an interesting way to shelf. So what this is, is this is Gwen's Princess Leia binder that holds her dice and her deck for when we play Star Wars Destiny. So I'm like, that works. And then finally, we have Tales of Equestria, the storytelling game starter set. So I didn't tell them it had to be board games. So they went and grabbed an RPG, which is perfectly cool. Uh, this is a My Little Pony role-playing game that my eldest really digs. Now, technically, they also managed to get Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters in there by having it behind the other games. <laughs> now, personally, I wouldn't have a game on a shelf that I couldn't see and show off, 
I have to give the girls credit for thinking inside the box, I guess. Fair enough. Now, not to be left out, Deanna also filled a cube. And uh, did she ever? Mm -hmm. (laughs) She went with terraforming Mars, suburbia, Takanoko, Yardmaster, Raiders of the North Sea, The Crew, Arboretum, Hanabi, Medium, Red 7, Letter Jam, Fleet, and Codenames Duet. Now, note, she did also use the kid's trick. There are games piled in behind others. She played Tetris here. Yes. Yeah, and, her uh, argument was that it's about space and storage, not about display. And uh, they, she also wants to note that the fox in the forest would be in there if Mo wasn't already using it, and it would replace Hanabi. Fair enough. So I gotta say, this was way more fun than we thought it would be. Like, I, I feel bad that Sean was left out not owning a Calyx to get to take part in this, because it was like, I don't know how many trips, I, I'm sure I hit my step goal today. Going upstairs and downstairs because I grabbed them on. I'm like, I'm totally doing these. And then I put them in and I'm like, oh, I have all this space on. There's got to be something thin I could fit. And then I go find something thin. Like at one point I had Car Wars in there because it's a nice thin box. <laughs> and I'm like, I got all this stuff going in there. And then I'm like, wait, what if I turn Quax this way? And then I'm like, oh, I can now stack all this other stuff and I can get Garinto in. I got to get Garinto in. And the fact the kids were like, can we do it? Like, like, can we, can we build one too? And I'm like, yeah, okay, go ahead. There are four shelves back there. And then once we had the kids doing it, I'm like, Deanna, you want to do a shelf too? And she, she did it. The thing is Deanna did, did um, family games, right? So these are games we would recommend to Brian. Um, what I want to see is I want to see Deanna's her own, like here, here's my, <laughs> my, my cube of joy or whatever, right? Like my favorite games. I, I want to see some uh, Trajan and um, Thurn and Taxis and stuff stacked in there as tightly as possible. Now, what I want to see is, I think this, having thought about it this morning as I was trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do, this would make a fantastic extra life contest at your local FLGS. Mm-hmm. Get a small, like, four by four, or even just a one by one, like a one uh, one square Calax, and allow, ga- and, uh, you know, working with your FLGS, of course, allow yeah. gamers to go and grab games off the shelf to fill their Calax in a set amount of time and have competitions. You know, who got the most games in, who got the most value into yep. a Calax, you know, and, and just, you know, how, ha- you know, have a few prizes out there for Calax stuffing. And, uh, Calax you know, stuffing. again, just make sure that your game store is involved and someone's watching to make sure they're not jamming games in there well, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and ruining perfectly good new product. Yeah, I'm going to have to think of, like, the shelf stuffer game. The board game shelf, the extra life shelf stuffer. And I'm trying to decide, is it, like, like supermarket grab or smash or whatever? Like, does I, oh, everyone yeah. run at once and they have their own shelf? No, I would say turns? everyone, it has to go one at a time. It's going to get, that. that's how you get damage if you let too many people do yeah, it Yeah, that's once. what I'm thinking. I'm like, I'm just thinking of the wall of games at the old CG room, which they still have at the new one. Yep. And having, I don't, a Calax sitting there and having everyone running over and fighting over stuff might be bad. But then I kind of want the who could stuff the shelf first. The other option, I think, if you wanted to really do some fun, I mean, the way you could, you know, if I if I were running a, uh, you know, a TV, a televised version of this, for instance, yeah. you know, a lot, get an actual game show on TV, you don't use the actual boxes. You make well, yeah. your own versions of boxes so that the size is correct. But, uh, and you, you know, you shove, stuff them with whatever, more cardboard or, you know, you know inflatable pillows from Amazon or whatever. But uh, you're not actually necessarily using new product, but that takes yeah. a whole bunch of preparation in advance uh, to build. I would totally games. watch that live stream. Though. That would be an awesome live stream to watch. Yeah. Then I think I would do a supermarket smash or whatever, right? Like, oh yeah, like yeah, sweet. absolutely. That that would definitely be. And then whoever gets done on time and has the least space left wins the game or something like that. There, there you go. go. Pax has an expedite. That's that's the, that's the precursor to the Calax. Right. All right, so there you have it. What we would fill, what we would each fill, or what my kids would fill a Calyx cube with, game-wise, with an eye towards family-friendly games. Now, what would you put in your cube? Let us know in the comments. Now, let's head over to the lobby and see what they would stuff their shelves with. All right, lobbyists, what have you got for us? So I do have some from our Discord, people who uh, we 
So if you are a Patreon patron of us, you get access to our private Discord. And one of the things we like to do there is we give everyone homework. So the day before our episode goes live, hopefully I plan that far ahead. Day before our episode <laughs> if goes live. If we know live, that far in advance. Yes. If we know that far in advance, I, I send out homework and I let people know what we're going to talk about and ask them to give us feedback. So what I've got, let's see, we have a four by, so there you go. Jeff Seuss owns a four by four Cubby Calax holding his RPGs. Um, Sean pointed out he could fill two cubes with just Supers book. So that, that's the next step is what, how many cubes does Sean collect? We should make that a contest. We make people bid like whatever, a <laughs> $5 entry to, to, to bet on how many Supers RP, how many Calax shells Sean can fill. Um, so Sean said, or Jeff says with board games, Area of Dracula, Concordia, Chinatown, and Cosmic Encounter. I do question if Concordia actually fits in a Calax without sticking out. I'm not sure. It's, it's a big, long box. It may fit. It may be perfect. It might just be 15 deep, but I, I do question that one. The rest I know will definitely fit. And then we have Danielle has pointed out Sagrada, Ex Libris, and quite a few indie RPGs. Totally get that. That's a legit way to fill a cube. Absolutely. And uh... Fax was intrigued by uh, Wingspan being a bigger box, but it's only 11 by 11 by 11.56 square with three inch height. Yeah, you've got to... you've got like almost three inches on this side there, two and yeah. a half inches. Yeah, you, could, you might be able to fit something else. No, the only one that's actually the standard ticket to side ride, the ticket to side, wow. <laughs> ticket to side ride, ticket to side ride, ticket to ride size on my list is Quacks of Quedlinburg. You can see my shelf is the one directly over my shoulder back there. Wax is the one standing up. So yes, that had just an like I don't know. There was like probably a full inch if you added up both sides, and that just felt too loose to me, and it felt like I was wasting space. And once I stacked it and put it next to Azul, I was like, oh yeah. So what I went with is the standard small box size, which is Gizmos, Corinto, Azul. There's that seems to be like the next step down. Uh, what you can't tell well from that picture is space base is actually even smaller between. Space base and quacks is where I shoved in cipher. You can kind of see the the, the tufts hanging out where you can pull that out. So the uh, the twenty seventeen third edition of Concordia is power grid. So it's uh, fourteen point six inches long, which gets you inside the. Oh, so it does fit. Okay, so fourteen point cool. six by ten point seven by two point two. That works. Yeah, that's a standard size box from Rio Grande. Rio Grande yeah. uses that box for power grid pitch car, which pitch car is not Rio Grande, but it's that size. Uh, Power Grid Factory Manager. I own a number of games. Yes, technically I have expansions. Yeah, there, there's. I think that's the only one with the. Let's see. The interesting thing about Board Game Geek, and and it doesn't really help me because I'm not as as knowledgeable as Mo. But when you go to look at the versions and and, and you're getting into that size, before you click, it says, "Oh, this is a Ticket to Ride size. This is a Power Grid size. This is a." There you go. <laughs> and yep. then you actually have to click to find the actual measurements that. Uh, that I find useful. See, where I was thinking was Amazon. Amazon always gives you the the width, like right. whatever, it'd be quicker. And they even even show someone holding it. Fair, yeah. No, I I just went straight to BGG. <laughs> I'm like, go to the versions, find the newest version, yeah, see what the box size works. is. Alrighty. Yeah, not no no one in the chat seems to actually have have Calaxes that they put games in. So well, and again, this, what I, I mean, do this takes some effort. Yeah. <laughs> This what I encourage job. people to do, though, is if you want to, do this challenge on your own. Do it at home. Send us a picture. Um, use hashtag shelf stuffer and let us see what you were able to fit in one, one Calyx cube. And then we'll bring them up when we come up the next week. And again, at Mountain Papa saying don't have kids games. Family-friendly games. Yep. Wasn't looking for kids games, right? And actually, to be honest, this is an older question. And Brian's kids are probably 12 plus at this point. <laughs> so we can probably go a little older. Brian has told me many times, he's like, no rush on my question. I'm in no rush. And I actually am sitting there currently because we are, we haven't had new questions in a while, working through the oldest stuff in the pile. Like I literally, because uh, I've been busy and things have been going on and now I'm trying to catch up on stuff. I'm like, whatever the first topic is on our list, we're doing it. Again, if you got a game or getting my question to us, Go to tabletopbellhop.com, click on Ask the Bellhop. There's even a spot on the side you can click to, I think, or you can email me, hit me up on social media, or it ends up if you reply to my newsletter, I will get it that way because that's how we got a question last week. Oh, oh. 
Welcome to a mostly spoiler-free look at the first Saga expansion for Space Base, The Emergence of Shy Pluto. Let's start off with that. Spoilers. Before we get to the actual review, I want to note that I will be saving all of the potential spoilers for the very end of this review. Overall, including the end, I'm going to completely avoid any spoiler story spoilers. I'm not going to mention anything about the storyline in this. You can explore that on your own. I'm not going to talk about that at all. But what I do want to do is highlight some of the new mechanics that are added to Space Base with this expansion. And to do that, I do have to spoil some of the things because you're going to learn about mechanics that you won't unlock until later in the game. But again, all of this is going to be saved for the very last section of the review, and we'll give you plenty of heads up once we enter spoiler territory. So Space Base, the emergence of High Pluto was designed by John D. Clare. This is the same designer as the base game and features artwork from Chris Walton was originally published in North America by AEG or Alderic Entertainment Group in 2019. Now this story-driven expansion plays two to five players and features a number of scenarios with each game taking between half an hour to an hour and a half, mainly depending on the player count. Now the MSRP on this expansion is $24.99 US dollars. Space Base, the emergence of Shy Pluto is what AEG is calling a saga expansion for safe space actually the first in a series of Saga expansions that currently is up to the second part. A strange new galactic body has been found, and it's up to you to determine what it is. You will do this through a series of story-based scenarios, each of which adds new components and mechanics to your game of Space Base. Now, after you complete the entire story, the entire Saga, most of that new content will just be integrated in with your Space Base game giving you a new space base experience going forward. And now, while not technically a legacy expansion, as most people would define it, this is something that would be a little annoying to remove again once you've deployed all the parts into the game. Is that correct? Yeah, it's not easy. There, there's two issues. For one, it would be a lot of stuff to go through. And I will say they did do a good job by indicating which cards are new. Um, they're marked and they are numbered. So you can even rebuild the decks back in order. There's a lot of cards to take out and that's three different decks you're going to have to go through to look for these little symbols to pull out. The other thing to note is this is all or nothing. You either use Shy Pluto or you don't. So as written, it's expected that you either leave all the stuff in or you take it all out. All right, well, for a spoiler-free look at the components of this story expansion for Space Base, Check out our unboxing space uh, video, Space Base, the Emergence of Shy Pluto unboxing on YouTube. So inside the box, you will find a rather thick rule book that starts off with an introduction story and introduce, introduces you to how to use all the stuff in this expansion. Just like in Space Base, rules are excellent, well laid out, very clear to read, lots of artwork and examples. Now the box includes a plastic insert that neatly holds a deck of large story cards, you know, the the tarot size cards, a discovery deck, these are those small skinny space base size cards, and two sealed mystery boxes. Now the component quality is here is excellent and matches the base game exactly. I could not tell the cards apart. Now I do appreciate also they included a number of warning cards to make sure you don't add anything to the game before you should. There's lots of stop, don't open this, and while you're going through the discovery deck, it tells you when to stop, even though like the rule books say add cards one to seven. Well, card eight says stop on it and isn't one of the cards you would include. You know, it's been disappointing that many other content creators have not been treating this with any sort of regard to spoilers, uh, despite the clear indication by AEG mm -hmm. that it has stages and reveals. Yeah, it's been kind of weird talking about this game because to me, it totally feels like a legacy game and totally feels like these are spoilers. So I wanted to make sure I didn't spoil anything for anyone. Now, the other thing that I do want to note that it does have some legacy style aspects where you are unlocking stuff and adding to the game as you keep playing. Nothing here will be destroyed. This is not a one and done. All the cards have indicators show where they're from and they're numbered so you can even rebuild the deck. So this isn't a one and done. There's nothing to write on. There's no stickers. There's none of those aspects of the game. You can technically, if you want, reset the expansion to play through it multiple times or easily pass it on to someone else when you're done with it. All right, well, so how are we using all this new stuff? Walk us through how to play Shy Pluto campaign. All right, so this is going to be high level because, again, I don't want to spoil anything. So you start off by setting up to play Space Space, just like you would in the base game with all the basic rules. 
You then read through the first couple pages of the rule book, which will then have you open up some of the other card packs and reading through some of the story cards that introduce you to the beginning of the game. Now, those story cards will tell you to open up the discovery deck and add some new space-based cards from the deck and put them into play. You then play space-based as you normally would with these new cards in play. Now, once on that story card, sorry, once you're playing, you're also going to look at that last story card will tell you what you should do to advance the plot, when you should flip over the next card. And again, I don't want to spoil it, but it's like, you will do this once this, this thing happens during the game. Now, what's interesting is this could very well happen, your first game. Like, you're going to play that first game, Wish I Pluto with those new cards in play and be like, hey, we did the thing and start going to the next one. Or it might take you multiple games before you've completed all the requirements on the story card. So it's not just play a game, flip to the next piece of story, yes. play a game, flip to the next piece of story. Something actually has to occur to trigger the next stage. Yes, exactly. So this is not like a game we reviewed a couple weeks back, which is the Wrath expansion for Draconis Invasion, which I can't help but compare these two while, while I've been looking at them because they're card games and they both unlock new packs that add new content. Well, the difference is when you're playing Draconis, there are 12 of them. And when you play one game, you open pack one. And then the next game you play, you open pack two. And the next game you play, you open pack three. Now, in this one, you're given a very clear open or flip the card, go to the next card when this happens. Now, once you do do that and you get to the next scenario, again, you're going to be told, go back to the rule book. And the rule book is where all the new rules are introduced and new mechanics and new icons, very similar to the original rule book. Then you're going to go back to the story cards and that's where it'll start telling you to put in new cards from the discovery deck. This continues for every future scenario. You, you do whatever it says in the story card, you unlock the new thing, you read the rule book, you read the cards until you unlock the next thing and keep going. Now, sometimes you're going to do this literally in the middle of a game. You will do the thing that it says in the card, flip it, and that game's going to change while you're playing. Others, though, will say flip the next card when you start your next game. So it depends on which scenario you're in. Now, in almost every case, the cards you add to your space-based game, you won't remove. They become a permanent part of your game. And that's actually how it's worded in the rule book. The, these cards, once added, become a permanent part of your game. Now, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that all of the new ship cards are going to end up in your game eventually. It's only some of the story cards that go away, as well as some of the other components that you're not necessarily going to use going forward. Right. So the game, the structure of the game uh, outside of the Shy Pluto playthrough stays more or less the same with, yes. uh, you know, bits and bobs change on certain cards, but you're still playing spaceships on yep. your, your player board. Yeah, you're still buying spaceships to deploy other spaceships to get... Get stuff on your turn with your ships and get stuff on other people's turns with your deployed ships. That does not change. Another interesting part about this expansion, which you may or may not take part in, is you can keep playing space space between the scenarios. So like, let's say you and your partner are playing through the campaign and you're really engaged and you want to do it, but then on the weekend, some friends come over and want to play. Well, there's no reason you can't just sit down and play space space, including whatever you've unlocked so far. And then after the friends leave and you get back together on the next couple of days, you can return to your campaign in another play. No, there's also no reason you can't just continue the campaign with new players. There's no reason, unlike a Gloomhaven or something, where you need the same people playing everything. There's no reason not to swap up the player group while playing. You don't need to have the same group playing every time. So though uh, some players may be a bit confused if they have played the base game before and all of a sudden these new strange cards show up out of the blue. Yeah, what I recommend is if, if you do have someone that's taking part partially or, or part of the campaign is let them read the story cards. Like here, go ahead and read through these while I'm setting up the game. And then they can also grab the rule book and look it up or just the way I've always played Space Base is when a new card shows up in the market, I explain what it does. So I just generally stick with that is, is you go, oh, oh let this is one of the new mechanics. Now, once you do finish all of the scenarios in the Emergence of Shy Pluto, most of the components you unlock become part of all your future games. And what they're calling that is a new gameplay module. So when you finish Shy Pluto, you unlock a new gameplay module for your future games of Space Base. All right, well, now that we have covered this vague overview of how this expansion works, <laughs> let's move on to what we thought of the Space Base expansion. Still, no spoilers. Still no spoilers, but we'll give you a fair warning. So the biggest surprise I had is, as Sean mentioned, no one seems to be 
hiding any of this, right? Everyone's just kind of talking about this game online on their Twitter and doing live streams as if it's like an expansion where you buy it and you open it up and you add some new cards to your game and you play. But that's not it. I had no clue this was a campaign story driven. Like I knew there was a story. It says it's a saga expansion. That means something. But I had no clue it was like a slowly unlocked content. I, I didn't know that was what I was getting into uh, when I first opened this. And you can hear my surprise if you watch that unboxing video. But I got to say, this is a welcome surprise. This format is fantastic for onboarding, for slowly introducing new content to a game. I love the fact that you are getting generally one small set of cards. Like the a, a slight spoiler, you're getting seven cards the first game. You get seven new cards. Boom. There you go. Seven new cards. Right? Actually, it might be six. Whatever. You get a small amount of new cards, one set at a time. And then they also stuck to adding only one new mechanic at a time. So it's not like sitting and learning all the iconography for space space at once. It's like, okay, here, you're going to learn this new icon. You're going to learn this new icon. Oh, now in this one, we're going to add these new icons. And it also does a really cool thing that I really appreciate where the new cards are added right into play instead of being shuffled in. Like almost every other card game expansion I've ever opened up just has you mix everything together. And then you could actually sit down to play whatever your favorite card game and clank with the new sunken treasure expansion and never draw a single sunken treasure card. Like it's, it's possible. It's not necessarily likely, but depending on the expansion and how many cards you're adding, well, at the beginning of the game, so let's say you're only adding seven cards or the odds of them coming up are terrible. Well, what this does is it makes sure they're in play the turn they're introduced, which I really love that. Indeed. It's tough to balance a game while adding new cards, but then to actually make sure they get into play as well. Mm -hmm. is a whole other difficulty that they seem to have managed to succeed at. Now, I also like the way content was unlocked. I, I like that it could take multiple games to actually complete scenario goals. And I wasn't expecting the opposite, the ability to progress through multiple scenarios in one game. And I didn't expect games to take multiples to get through them. I thought that was really neat. Like, I think it's honestly only one scenario that's like, next time you start a game of Space Space, use this. Every other game was like, so you unlock the thing. And once you do this, you're going to unlock new stuff and keep going. Now, there is one thing we found a bit of a downfall to this system is the speed you are going to get through the content. How quick you're going to hammer through Shy Pluto is going to be very dependent on your number of players and who I'm are playing the game. I'm guessing it's a lot faster the more players you add in. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of the unlocks are by rolling a certain number or buying a specific set of cards. And while the more players are playing, the more common those numbers are going to come up, right? The, the more often you're going to roll the right number, the more often the stuff's going to get bought and empty out the market. So with more players, you're going to hammer through this quicker. So it's just a, it's, it's not a good or a bad thing, but realize if you're playing two players, it's going to take you a while to get through Shy Pluto, where if you're playing the max five player count, you might be able to hammer through it in one night. Now, as for the story, I, it was solid. It was good. Um, I, significantly better than the other game we mentioned a little while ago. Writing was good. Um, what you unlocked and added to the game actually fit the story like it just made sense now we're going to build these things to do this thing and you're like oh now i have the cards where i can build these things um while there are some sections that were more fun than others there were none that weren't fun like all of them were enjoyable there was no like oh those cards i don't like those cards everything was good um in particular the climax i guess i'll call it was awesome um enough so that i've been tempted to reset my game to that state again and just play through that a few more times and possibly save it up so that like if I'm playing at public play, it'd be like, oh, you like space space here. Let's do let's do the climax of Shy Pluto while just taking out the future cards. Well, since I'm uh, still interested in seeing what the unfolding experience uh, is about and experiencing that, we'll have to see about trying that sometime when I'm down. Yeah, even if you again, if you don't play through the whole thing, maybe just try that one specific mm -hmm. scenario. Now, as for the actual new cards and mechanics, uh, there's some really cool stuff going on here that I think are awesome additions to the game. Um, again, keeping this high level and vague, there's going to be ways to do more on your turn uh, to get more stuff on opponent's turn. Um, there is a new dice rolling mechanic that I do find odd because it has players generating resources for themselves and only themselves, which just seems contrary to the original, like to me, mission statement of Space Base that everyone is invested in every role. That definitely does change with Shy Pluto, which I think is important to know. So this, when I heard about it, was really kind of the strangest aspect. Much of the strength of this game comes from the fact that there is almost no downtime 
Uh, mm -hmm. You're always at least potentially generating resources on others' turns. And to step back from that constant activity seems like a major concession. Yeah, it's a little strange. Um, I'm going to get into something in the spoiler aspect, but by the time you do finish it, there is something that counteracts this a little bit, but it just feels odd. And to be honest, it didn't, I thought it bothered me. Like the first time I played with it, I was like, whoa, this is strange. But then I got kind of used to it. And especially being the one that gets the bonus resources feels good on your turn. You're like, oh, I'm so close to being able to get the thing. Oh, wait, I get the bonus dice. And oh, sweet, I can get the thing. So so I got to say, and, and overall, it's still a quick game. Like, like waiting for one person to roll one set of dice to generate one more set of resources shouldn't take all that long. Now, that said, I do appreciate the ability to remove this expansion due to, again, the fact the cards are numbered and marked. Though it is a pain. Like, uh, I personally wouldn't want to keep swapping things up. I was getting a little annoyed with it the other day. I'm like, oh, shoot, we took everything out. We got to shuffle it all back in. I'm like, oh, we have a new player. We're going to have to take it all out. I think in general, most people, uh, myself included, are probably going to finish I Pluto and just leave everything in. And I think that's one of the reasons we see so many spoilers for this, is people aren't willing to go to the effort to hide the stuff from the expansion. They just want to play Space Base with the expansion in. Now, speaking of leaving everything in, um, you can fit all of the unlocked material into the box, including keeping the original space base insert, but that's just the stuff you can keep using. This doesn't include some of the stuff that doesn't carry over and things like the story cards, the stop cards, the two mystery boxes, like the physical boxes or the shy Pluto box itself. But all of the content you unlock, you can keep and will fit in the original insert. Which is always nice. And unless you're considering uh, again, that whole replay from scratch or resale, the story cards are useless once you've unlocked everything, correct? 99% uh, of them. I'll just say it that way. <laughs> you don't need most of them. But yeah, I would just keep them so if someone wants to read through the story. Or again, if you do decide to reset at some point. Mm -hmm. So while we had a great time playing through the story, like we really enjoyed playing through this short campaign. We liked playing the story of Emergency Side Pluto. And I dig most of the new cards that were added to the game. What I'm not sure on is the overall effect, that, that, that module, as they call it, that is unlocked at the end. It's, it's what happens to my copy of Space Base when I'm done. Once you're finished with the story, you have this new way to play. And it introduces a new resource and something new and highly random to spend that resource on. Again, spoilers in a bit. Now, having played a number of games with this new system, I'm not sure I can say that part, that module improves the game. And the people I've been playing with felt the same. Like, on one hand, it's a new thing. It is something to keep the game interesting and fresh. And if you're kind of sick of space base, it will change things up. So big thumbs up for that. Um, it also adds even more dice rolling to the game. So if you are a huge fan of dice rolling, let me just say that this expansion is for Shadowrun and Champion fans. If you are a fan of, of rolling lots of dice and higher luck factor, you're probably going to dig this. It also gives something for the players to do on other players' turns, which kind of makes up for that new dice mechanic I mentioned. The problem, though, is you now have to buy cards to get a new resource, then spend that new resource to get the new thing. And I'm not sure if it's worth it, where you could have just spent your money to give you one of the basic cards that give you points, victory points, or, you know, the stuff you usually get. Although buying those has gotten more difficult because all of these new cards dilute down the original deck. So like the very ubiquitous, everyone gets them. They're always available green shift right cards. You know, the ones I'm talking about where you get to shift right for one or two, as long as you, you spend a charge cube and then you, you have to use both dice added together. Like those are a big part of strategy in the original game for anyone who's played it. I'm sure you're well aware. Well, there, just aren't, there are as many in the deck, but because there's so much other stuff in the deck now, they don't come up as often. And the more important one is there are, again, not less victory point ships, but victory point ships are less common. So ones that when you generate a number start giving you points, which are really important to winning the game, are harder to find in the deck. So not a raving review, even after quite a few plays with it all unlocked, yeah. indecision remains. Honestly, I, it's, it's bad. I feel, like, I feel like I'm not allowed to sit on the fence, but like I know there's people out there that love it. Like, like there are people who are like, oh, you can't play Space Base without Shy Pluto. Game's garbage without it. Oh, you got to play Shy Pluto. It fixes Space Base. And I got to say, I, I, I can see it in a way that some people may think this, but personally, I don't agree with it. I don't think this fixes a problem, but rather presents a new option. And it just, 
a new option. I'm not sure is worth it all the time. Like right now while writing this, I'm not even sure if I like the new system or not. I don't hate it. Like that would be easy. It'd be like, oh, this is a terrible expansion. I don't like the end result. Never use it. Just pull out everything out of Shy Pluto. I, I don't hate it, but I also don't love it. Like I've never had a game where I was like, oh, I'm so glad I played with the new module because it let me win. What I really wish is there was an easy way to turn off the module, right? A quick way to just remove that part, just the, the last part. While I can pretty quickly remove all of Shy Pluto, because again, I'm looking for symbols and pull them out, that's not what I want. The way it's designed, it's all or nothing, right? At, at least as written. What I'm tempted to do is just go through myself and get rid of cards that generate the new resource and remove the whole thing you can buy with it, leaving everything else in. Yeah, see, this is uh, personally, I don't feel like sorry, it's been it was a broken game. Yeah. So that, that, that's that's my first problem with this whole it, it fixes a broken game is I, I don't really feel like it was broken. Now, I again, I haven't played Shy Pluto. Um, but one thing I would say is that many games now these days are putting in these features where expansions aren't one monolithic concept mm -hmm. like it is here in Shy Pluto. Uh, instead, you get a bunch of individual pieces that can be added or not while still all remaining under the one expansion's umbrella. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I'm trying to think... Uh, Orléans is the one is the one yep. that first comes to mind where you get an expansion that's yeah, got multiple parts. Yeah, you got all these different them. parts, but you pick and choose. And if if your if your play style doesn't like this at the table, then you don't put it in. Yeah, Orléans is actually a perfect that's for the trade and intrigue. No one I played with likes intrigue, but everything else in that expansion I love. Deanna doesn't like the the pick up and deliver. I don't remember what it's called. The trade I think is what that one is where you're right. bringing goods. She didn't like that aspect. So when I play with Deanna, I don't use that one. When I play with anyone, I don't use the intrigue board. I only know one group of gamers that likes the intrigue board, and, and, <laughs> and, and it fits that group. Yep. Yes, it fits that group well. Like to be honest, like like you were saying, it, it it's a, a not not very positive review. And to be honest, no, it is. It, it, I did enjoy playing this. I had a great time playing through the campaign. There were some really fun moments, and it, I love the way it adds new content. I, I, I really dig that tell a story, put a bit in at a time, let you play with that new thing and discover it through play. I loved unlocking new stuff and getting to try out, try out the new materials. And I love the onboarding. Like, like everyone should be doing this. Everyone who puts out an expansion, do this kind of onboarding. Like, like don't just give me a new meeple to put on the board. Give me the meeple at the start of the turn to put on the board, right? Like take that extra step. Now, while player count did affect how quickly we got through it, my biggest concern with this expansion, of course, is that end result. I'm still not completely sold on the new play module that's unlocked in the end, and I think different people are going to have different feelings about this final change. Now, thankfully, if you don't love this end result, you can pretty easily modify your copy of the game and keep the bits you do like. And there is lots to like. All those other new cards are awesome. It's just that final thing that I'm not sure of. All right, well... So who is the emergence of Shy Pluto for? Well, first off, people own Space Base because it is completely useless if you don't have Space Base. So what I will say, though, is if you like Space Base, if you own it, enjoy it, and play Space Base and expect to keep playing it, pick this up. It's good. Even if you only play through it once and then decide to take everything out at the end, I think it's a worthwhile experience. It's at the price point of an exit game, or sorry, an unlock game, or one of the bigger exit games. And while you get a similar experience, more, a longer experience. You're, you're going to play, I don't know, five, six, 12 games of Space Base before you unlock everything. So I think it's well worth it at that point. I also find it unlikely you're not going to find something you like in Shy Pluto. Even if it's just one new ship type, you could throw that in your game and get even more out of it than playing the campaign. So to me, the campaign's worth it on its own. Anything you choose to keep after the campaign is icing on the cake. With the added bonus that you could resell it or pass it on. And if you're not a lover of Space Base. So if you have Space Base, it's okay. You play it now and then, you're kind of sick of it. I don't think this one's going to change your mind. Now, if your problem is that I played it a million times and it's always the same, this may, may win you over. But I, I will say, I, I, we seem to be the minority in this one. Because many people have indicated that they think this expansion fixed the game. So what I would recommend is give it a shot. Or stay tuned uh, for the, the next part of the show 
where we will be spoiling some things. So listen to the spoilers, listen to what the new cards do and see if that sounds cool. Uh, go watch an actual play to see it played, or you can play this on Tabletop Simulator. So grab it on Tabletop Simulator, sit down. It's free on Tabletop Simulator. Sit down, play a game with all this new stuff and see if it's for you. What I wouldn't do is if you're if you're like, eh, Space Base is okay, I don't. I wouldn't rush out and buy this hoping to save your game with Space Base. All right, well, that's it for the spoiler-free portion of this review. Now, we're still not going to be spoiling the story at all, but we did want to talk about some of the specific detail and new mechanics added to the game and with a focus on the end result of finishing Shy Pluto. So the best part of this expansion is the variety of new cards and new card abilities that are added. So here it is, last warning, mechanical spoiler starting now. This to get anyone who's like, you know, doing their dishes or whatever. We need a klaxon, ding the bell, whatever. So the first set of new cards that you're going to add adds a lightning bolt icon. So when cards with this icon are activated, you get to add a charge cube to any other card, deployed or not, your choice. This person, I think, is a welcome addition. It's a great way to get cubes on those eight plus cards that are hard to roll without having to get those numbers rolled. In Indeed. Charge cubes, as we've mentioned in the past when talking about this game, are some of the most complex aspects of the game. Uh, so it's nice to get a little more use out of them and, and yeah. more involved involvement with them. And to be honest, by the time you're playing Shy Pluto, unless you bought it with the base game, you're probably now pretty comfortable using charge cubes. Mm -hmm. And you know some of the best strategies are to get this charged up and they get this charged up and then spend this, then this, to do this, to do that, right? Now, another early unlock, this isn't a lock right at the beginning, is a new set of white D6 dice. Now, I could have mentioned them earlier. I did mention a dude die rolling system, but like they're right in the box. They're not hidden. They're not in one of the mystery boxes. So everyone knows you get these nice, pretty dice. I personally think they're better looking than the original dice in the game. Uh, but they do that thing that I mentioned, where you can roll the dice to activate your ships. And it's an ability that shows a new symbol that shows these two dice. They're, for some reason, they're black dice in the icons with arrows. So that always confuses people. And if you activate a ship that has that on it, you then can roll the white dice and you generate resources. But again, you only get it for you. Only you get the stuff on the white dice. The other players get nothing. So this is what I was worried about where the whole every roll matters, but it doesn't with these white dice. And in addition to that, there are even more ways to get these white dice than just ships, which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah, my gut instinct is to dislike this mechanic, but I'd have to see how much it actually impacts play before uh yeah i'm so disappointed your work's been so busy we were really we're supposed to get in a game before we did this review but i'm like oh we ran out of time again this bothered me at first just because it broke the the, the magic circle of space base that every die roll matters for everyone but then it didn't find it that bad and by the time we get to the end of this that other thing kind of offset this so that you're busy doing your own thing anyway now, a very welcome addition is a variety of new arrow cards. I love arrow cards in Space Base. You can set up some awesome combos with arrow cards. These include arrows that point diagonally instead of side to side. These are my favorite ones. These cards are activated. They let you collect the resources of an adjacent card, but of the opposite type. So when you roll it on your own ships, on your dock ships, you're going to get to activate some deployed ships in an adjacent number. And well, vice versa, if you roll it on an opponent's turn, it'll let you activate some of your personal ships. Other new arrow cards include cards that give you something and cards next to you. Um, there's ones that give income. There's ones that give credits in the card next to you. And then ones that are shifts left instead of shift right. So all the green ones let you shift right, right? Which gives you generally better cards, though not necessarily. Well, there's new arrows that activate on your turn and on the opponent's turn that let you shift left one or two. And you don't have to use the total of the dice. So I just found those very versatile for kind of, you know, being able to adjust your numbers the point to that big powerful card you've got although i i feel like i've used the diagonal cards before without ever playing shy pluto so i is are are there some of those in the base game or was something left into our digital version all i can think of is you seeing the tweets i was sharing when i first unlocked them and i showed you that big combo i had they no, we I, have I've never used, used arrows i have absolutely used the diagonal arrows uh, they, they are only unlocked in the third scenario of Shy Pluto. So it's weird. I, I wonder if there was something in in that got maybe. left in in our digital play then. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I and possibly, or maybe when we played down here. No, because I don't think you played since I put in the no. Shy Pluto stuff. No, I haven't. 
That's why I'm wondering if we played Shy Space Base with Shy Plu in it down oh, here. Oh, maybe. But we hadn't finished. That's maybe. what I'm trying to remember. Maybe, maybe we had locked, unlocked some of it. Possibly. I don't know. But the diagonal cards are awesome. And to be honest, I, I love all of the arrow cards. Like, like having more arrow cards is one of the big thumbs up, especially the diagonal. I love that shift between the two different resource generation mechanics in the game. Uh, eventually, you unlock variable sector cards. So what these have, instead of a single number in the top right, it'll say like 8 plus or 1 plus. And what those do is when you bought, purchase those cards, you can put them in slot 8 or higher, or you can put them in slots 1 or higher, which lets you uh, possibly more powerful than the card you're placing, lets you deploy basically any card on your thing, which can be huge. I love being able to pick any spot to place a ship and deploy. Yeah, so these are a, a big deal and rumored to be a major factor in the next expansion as well. So sounds like more of those. Now, there are other new cards. Um, one of the neat things they do is at the beginning of the game, they give you a hand of starting cards. So normally when you start Space Base, you draw off the one deck and everyone gets a random card. Well, when you play Shy Pluto the first time, they give you new cards that you shuffle and every player gets a new card. So that's part of that. Introduce the new mechanics right away. Um, so there's those, and then there are just a bunch of new cards with new abilities, right, that, that come out. Now, the biggest change, and this is the thing I think most important to talk about and why I almost didn't want to put spoilers on this because I kind of want to explain this, it's when you get to the boss fight and you unlock patrol ships and all the cards that generate patrol ships. So patrol ships are a new resource that you indicate through tokens, little cardboard tokens. They come in one of the seal boxes. Now, the mission you unlock them in is the best of the bunch. It's it's the climax I mentioned earlier. It's 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 a boss fight where we we had a hard time calling them patrols. So we were like they're fighters because you're attacking something and having to defeat it, and it might take multiple games to defeat this thing. Um, this is the one I want to reset. Now the problem with this scenario is it introduces stuff that only happens in this fight, like only ever happens in this fight, including a set of dice that are only used in this fight. There's like a big blue die and a bunch of little tiny dice that you only use for this particular fight only, which just seems weird. Yeah. <laughs> so a fun one and done. That's yeah. frustrating. But that's why I kind of want to reset to this one sometime. So I don't know, like that, that was the biggest here stuff I'll never use again. Let's put it aside. Now, after the box fight, you unlock what is called Miners of Shy Pluto a gameplay module for Space Base. That's in quotes. Is Miners of Shy Pluto a gameplay module for Space Base? This is the part that changes up all your games of Space Base going forward. When the boss is defeated, you unlock a ton of little purple dice and you get a baggie for them that even has like Space Base on it. It's a really nice baggie and you put them all in there. Those patrol ships are now part of the game from now on. Though now they're kind of mining ships instead of fighters. There are now even more cards you throw into deck to generate those ships and they're split over all three of the market deck so it's not like they're all level one cards they're all over the place now these new patrol ships are used for one thing and one thing only which is buying these new dice and these new dice are called shy plutonium cubes so there's a starting set of these that are more reddish than purple that are randomly placed onto this new shy pluto board with six spots above each slot for the dice is a cost in patrol ships Lowest costing two, the highest costing four. At the end of any of your turns, you can spend patrol ships to take one of these dice. Take some shy plutonium for yourself away from this board. Then all the cubes slide down to the left and a new one's drawn from the bag. Now the ones in the bag are actually better than the ones that start up at the beginning of the game. Now each shy plutonium cube features five blanks. The D6, five are blank, one side with a bonus symbol on it. You're going to roll all of your shy plutonium dice every turn. Though when you're playing four or five players, you do you skip your turn. You only roll your, your purple dice on the opponent's turns. And then you're going to take any face-up bonuses that's showing on these dice. Now, these bonuses include your main resources, credits, income, points. I, uh, there is also one that generates um, ships. And there is one that generates rolls of the white dice. So do you ever start to lose track of what color dice do what? It just seems like it's, it's the, the number of dice in this game has uh, gone up remarkably. What they did that's actually kind of smart, though I don't get why, maybe for cost, is the standard blue dice are what you roll every turn. So that didn't change. The new dice that roll on your turn are white, but the, honestly, they're just decent. You could roll the blue ones. 
Uh, the white choice is weird again because the icon's black, but I think it just so it shows up. So I don't go, know why they didn't give you black dice. Then all these new dice are Hobbit dice or something. They're they're small, very rounded dice. Like they do not have hard corners. Um, you'll see pictures on the written review, I'm sure. Um, and I don't know how many I have on any of my social media pictures because I try to avoid those. <laughs> but they are smaller, so they do stick out. Uh, the only part that's annoying is having to separate one color between games. So what I do is I keep all the purple ones in the bag and the red ones I should just put separate in the box in a trough just so I don't get them mixed up. And I just found them on BGG. So that, yeah, yeah they're exactly... tiny little dice and they're very rounded, very rounded yes. corners. So what this mining expansion does, it adds a new resource to the game in the form of patrol ships, but it also has the potential for a ton more dice rolling. And these dice add a huge random element to the game. Because again, each die only has one side that gives you anything. It's the odds on these dice, the, the one in six chance they actually give you anything that has everyone I played with questioning their worth. Using Miners of Shy Pluto adds a lot more luck to what's already a luck heavy game. And that's the part not everyone's going to like. Yeah, though, though it makes sense mechanically with mining being a long churning process that doesn't always result in you getting th something yeah true thematically sure it works it works i think my biggest complaint about miners of shy pluto is that they call it a module to me a module is something you can turn on and off and as we noted earlier this is designed to be all or nothing you technically as written can't play the game without using shy plutonium dice and then your deck like like you could pull the shy i guess you could you could pull the shy plutonium dice up but then your deck's filled with all these cards that give you patrol ships. And all the patrol ships are useless for the dice. Now, you could just remove everything marked as Shy Pluto, but then you miss out on cool things like those lightning bolts and the, the new new shifters, the new arrows, and the, the new card that lets you activate any of your blue abilities. And, like, you lose all that. Like, it's just weird that you lose the good stuff and this. Like, there's no way to literally just strip out the one thing. No easy way. So how broken would it be if you just ignored those patrol ships? So the problem is almost every ship that gives you patrol ships, that's all it does. So they become literally useless cards. Like there would be absolutely zero reason to buy them. Well, I guess they flip the card that's there. They're a way to deploy your ship, but like they're even less useful than colonies because they will get you nothing, absolutely nothing. Now, what I think you could do is just manually remove it. Literally go through the deck, face up, don't look at Shy Pluto cards and just remove any card that generates patrol ships. That should work. And honestly, I think this is an option that should have been included officially. Like I, I've mentioned before, we've got an entire episode on house rules. I hate house ruling games. In general, if I feel I need to house rule a game, I'm just like, well, the game's not great. I should go play another game that works. And I kind of feel that way with this. Is I'm like, if you had officially said, you know, one way to play without the module is go through and just remove this and feel free to use the rest of Shy Pluto. I'd feel better about it. And I realize it's silly. It's, it's the rules lawyer in me. So those are the big game changes in Shy Pluto. Now, along with this, you do get a bunch of other new cards with cool abilities, including more cards that let you swap spots of cards in your tableau, cards that exist only to activate other cards. Like they don't do anything on their own, but they let you do something. There's even a card that's like, let me let you activate any card to your left and so on. All in all, there's a lot of cool stuff in here that adds a lot of variety to space space, regardless whether you love or hate or are indifferent to the new mining module. Well, that's it for our review of Space Base, The Emergence of Shy Pluto. I invite you also to check out Mo's written review of this expansion over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. I want to add a note in here. I realize I'm deviating from the script here, but... um. We should have figure out what timestamp that's at so we can tell people where to jump to get here. Like do a voiceover or something yeah, yeah. just to say. Because that's that's the part I feel bad is if anyone is here with us live and they, they wouldn't know when to come back. Like I should have said, hey, I'll send a tweet or something. <laughs> We're back. We're not spoiling anymore. So okay, game plays. It actually happened. I actually have games. I, my wound has healed uh, well. Uh, we're good there. I've been discharged. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, we actually got in a game night this past Friday. 
which started with Space Base, playing with the rule changes and new mechanics that came out at the end of Cy Pluto. Uh, honestly done so that we could review the game tonight. Now, I've already shared my thoughts on that earlier. We just finished that up. So what I will add here is that Tat and Tori felt the same as Deanna and I in regards to the new module. Like Deanna and I played it a couple players. Um, I can't, we played it with someone else besides Tori and Kat. And everyone's just kind of like, I don't know. Like, like, and, and what we did explore a lot is we played two games is we went, a couple of us went heavy mining. And I will say once you got five or six of those dice, rolling them all at once feels kind of good. And you do get that yes moment when they do generate because the odds are so bad on those dice, because it's one in six, when you do get stuff, it does feel very rewarding, but it still didn't seem to have much impact. Like, like no one won the game because they bought all these. And I still question how useful they are as opposed to buying something in say your six slot, that's going to hit more often than any other number on the board. Like, do I start generate? Cause, cause there's multiple steps, right? You got to generate ships. And then once you have the ships, you got to buy the dice. And having to do all that, I don't know. So you're perhaps leaning more towards liking it, but the jury is still out. Yeah, I, I it's okay. <laughs> I, I like it. This is one of those ones where I leave it up to the people I'm playing with, but I don't want to waste the time to take it out either. So I think in general, we're probably just going to play with it. And the one nice thing in a way is you could just not, do it right just don't buy any of the new ships. now everyone does start with one patrol ship that is part of the new setup for the new game that i didn't mention in the review and i guess probably wouldn't have been that big a spoiler but anyway you do start with one patrol ship but you do need two to do it you're gonna have to buy at least one card to start generating patrol ships to even interface with that part of the expansion and while it is still a very valid way to play to totally ignore it and we've had people do that during our games where i think it might break is if you're playing five players and no one ever buys any and then you're going to end up with a market that fills with them. But you know what? Then someone buys a couple of them and then they start buying the ships. Like, I, I don't think it's going to be broken. I just think it's not necessarily part of a winning strategy. And in that case, why have it in the game if it's not a valid strategy? Like, I, I, I don't know. It's got that come behind win thing. Like, like, maybe someone who buys enough of them will get lucky enough to win, even though they don't have any ships that generate points or something. I don't know. I, I don't think I'm going to take the time to take it out. <laughs> I just don't know how often when I'm playing, I will interact with that mechanic. Uh, it might deal with what kind of game night it is, right? If it's if it's a New Year's game night and we're doing some beer and pretzels, I'm going to want to roll dice. I'm going to be in that mood where I want that random factor. Whereas if Tori's bragging that he's won too many times in a row and it's time to smack Tori down in a game of space base, I'm going to pay more attention. <laughs> Probably not buy the random cards. Now, the other thing we did try for the first time on Friday was the accelerated start system in Space Base. Now, this is something from the base game. We just never got around to trying. We probably should have before the review, but it's not like it was pilot of obligation. Um, this is a variant where, and like, Sean, you played enough, so you can tell how cool this could be, is you get 15 credits at the start of the turn. You get 15 gold or credits, whatever they're called. You then draw four level one cards and two level two cards. You then buy as many of those as you want and put them on your board and deploy the other ships with those 15 credits. Any credits you don't spend are saved for the start of the game, but the player who spent the least, so who has the most money, becomes the start player. You also all start with one income, which one income doesn't sound like a lot, but in that game, starting with one income is a big deal. I really liked this variant. I liked having choices right at the start of the game, it's awesome having a number of already deployed ships in the early turns. None of that. It went around the table four times before I got anything. Well, assuming you bought ships in a variety of different numbers, you could also just buy all your ships on one number. Someone tried that. It paid off well, actually. Um, I, I dig it. it and, and I like that the engagement is up right away. Because usually at the beginning of the game, you're like, oh, did you roll a six? No. Whereas, oh, did you roll a six, five, four, and, or a seven? No? Okay. Right? Like that engagement was there. And well, you all know how much I love is asymmetry. And it made the game feel asymmetric from turn one. Like you were doing this thing, you were doing this thing, I'm doing my thing, you're doing that thing. And you can kind of see where people are going to head from there. So I dig that. At this point, I honestly think I might use this variant every game we play. Like like going forward, I think we should just use this. Uh, this I, I was reading this earlier as I was going through the notes and kind of amazed at just how vast a, a boost this is like i, I mm -hmm. it's, unless you've played the game it doesn't necessarily seem like it could be all that big a deal but this is a huge 
start. Like the, this really ramps the game up into like fourth, fifth turn yep. of the game right off the bat. Yep. Though that may not matter. So in the past, we talked about the card, the one card in space space. Everyone seems to hate. This is a card that lets you buy a second time. So it gives you a purchase and removes three victory points from every other player. Hugely powerful when playing five players. Now, in the past, I've noted, I don't think this card's overpowered because that's what most people I've seen mentioning this card complain about. And I agree. It's I, I disagree. It's it's not overpowered, in my opinion, because I have yet, in all the games of Space Space I played, and I'm up into double digits now, we've never had a player who used this card win the game. So I don't think the power is the problem here. The problem is that it draws out the game and makes it longer, potentially getting to that longer than I enjoy it place like they like overstays its welcome people like to say it. now our second game on friday when this card came up is the one we used the accelerated start this game took an hour and a half longer than our first game i've never had a game of space space go on that long before and at that point it was it was like all right like people are like all right just go win right like the players were just go win and it was at the point we probably should have went you know what d's in the lead let's just give it to her because it was just, you, you deke up a bit, I'd knock it down. You deke up a bit, knock it down. I was the one that had the card. I had no cards to generate victory points. So despite knocking everyone else down, I wasn't going up. So it was just like playing a stalemate. I felt like playing a game of Munchkin where, you know, I'm level eight, I'm level seven. I'm level nine, I'm level six. I'm level seven, I'm level five. And I just can't hit that 10th level. So you win, internet. I'll side with you. Though maybe not for the same reason as most of you are saying. Feel free to remove that card from your copy of Space Base. Put it in the shy Pluto box with the leftovers that didn't get added to the core game. There you go. Sometimes the screaming masses of the internet are right. So Mountain Papa had a question I'm going to jump into right now uh, about do I like the expansion or am I trying to like it? The thing is, we liked the expansion. We loved playing through shy Pluto. The story was awesome. The unlocking was awesome. The seeing new stuff and seeing, oh, look what this does. Or putting the card out for the first time. What's that do? Oh, that seems huge. That part was a ton of fun. That end bit is where we have the question. So I, I love the expansion. So I'm already thinking positively for the expansion. And the first time you see it, it's like, oh, I'm totally going to collect all the ships I can. And I'm going to buy all these dice. And I'm going to get all these extra resources. But then it doesn't work because of the luck factor. And you see the players that collected all the dice and spent all the turns generating ships fall behind the players who just went there and played space Base normally, I guess, played with old strategies of make sure you buy cards that have victory points on their deployed side. That, that, that always will be the winning strategy, I think, in space space. And then try to get other cards that shift so those cards happen more often, right? So the players doing that basic strategy tend to win over the players playing with the new thing. But the new thing's kind of fun. Right, like the the rolling, depending on the type of game you're playing. Again, depending on who I'm playing with, the dice are more awesome. D and I playing, we're both strategic players. The dice aren't fun. Playing with Tori, let Tori buy all the dice just because I want to see his reaction when either he rolls no hits or all the hits. Right, because he's fun to play with that way. So I don't think it's a fact we're trying to make it fun or find the fun in it. It's the fact that it's not always fun. Like in in the fact that it's it so far is yet to be a winning strategy. If anything, it's more of a comeback strategy. And perhaps that's where it's best served, is if you're losing, start buying ships and dice because maybe you'll get a bunch of lucky rolls and suddenly jump into the lead. Sure. All right, so the next game we played on Friday was Roll Camera. This was only my second play of this movie-making cooperative dice placement game. And I got to say, it went over great. Uh, played really well, caught it really well. Um, it our first play was great too, so no change from the first play. Digging the themes, digging the mechanics, really digging the tension level. One of the most important things in a cooperative game is that tension that, oh my God, we're going to lose. Oh, what do we do? What? How are we going to get some money? You need that in that game, and this game has it in spades. Now, this time we played four players, and we tried normal difficulty. Last game was easy difficulty with three players, I think it was. Uh, we managed a close win. Like, like we won the game. So to win the game, your quality has to be out of the red. Our movie was worth watching. So that gave us plenty of room to have done better, but we also weren't so bad we lost the game. Now we did get a different mix of roles in the game, which was neat to see. So one of the things I do appreciate about role players, the designer included more 
roles that you play, individual player roles that are asymmetric, then the player counts. So every game you can get a different mix. And I do dig that variety. Now, the big thing with this one is I do want to review it. So far, it's looking great, but I've only played twice. So the goal is to get in a few more plays, hopefully this weekend. And uh, we do have Tori and Kat coming over Friday, so we're going to play with them. I don't know if we're doing the in-laws this weekend, but I do want to get some more role player, or sorry, excuse me, role camera in. And hopefully we'll be ready to review this one next week. Well, we look forward to hearing some more about it. Now, the final game we played this past week was Gloomy Graves, and I honestly can't remember if I talked about this on this show or not before. So I think we have, or if it was a, if it was a, um, I thought it might have been a, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank on that thing we do on some <laughs> brunch. We we did we did cover it in one of the ta- Bell Ops tabletop episodes. So we did. All right. So so again, it's a spooky game. Uses kind of a dominoes like system to build graves, and you're building graves for fantasy creatures. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Uh, the neat part here is that there are only five different types of bodies you're bearing, and you can only score each of them once. And once you scored it, you can't you can't again, right? So there's this whole thing where you're trying to build the biggest area of a color and snag it before another player does. Uh, we played two games of this. Um, there was something we figured out. We were playing Extreme, which is bad for us, which is weird because the last time we played, we didn't. But when playing with Torian Cap, we played Extreme. Very important rule to remember. You cannot have a Grave Digger standing next to another one because they're antisocial, which totally works because otherwise you just fill your personal grave with all Grave Diggers and you just drop in whatever color you want and then it all combos together, which once I noticed that, mechanic was broken i'm like wait we're missing something so we did do that wrong it's simple enough just make sure you yeah as diana said it's it, the rules are simple enough so it felt like i remembered them all well i forgot a rather important <laughs> but fair enough it was still fun this is a really cute well cute spooky cute game you are dealing with dead bodies but the, the art's spooky not spooky or creepy or gross there's no blood or anything um this is one of those quick to learn difficult master the game master games that honestly is way more than it looks like like the basic mechanics sound simple play two graves do this but once you start playing it's highly interactive and competitive this is very much a take that game and i dig it a lot now our friends tori and kat though are the biggest spooky season fans i've known for years and i used to hang out with goths all the time so like this is they're they're really into it uh, especially the spoopy cute part of it so they love this game so much. I honestly just let them keep the game at the end of the night. I'm like, hey, you guys take this home. And they're like, no, no. And I'm like, who am I going to play it with? Like, like maybe I bring it out to the CG realm, but like D and I are not going to play this when we can sit down and play the Duke or Space Base or some of the other two-player games we really enjoy. My kids might have enjoyed it, but they have plenty of their own games. Plus, they appreciate the Halloween theme a lot more than we do. So we passed that game on. So that one needs to be updated on Board Game Geek 2 previously in my collection. And no, people don't often leave the Bellhops tabletop with games, <laughs> so don't get your hopes up if you're invited to stay at the hotel. Though I will say I did give a game away to every single one of our Patreon patrons this past week, so it does happen. Well, now how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? So the big thing is I, I have something to unbox, right? I have, a, oh, it's no longer right near me. I can't show it off. I have Land vs. Sea. This is the latest game from Good Games Publishing, which up until this point has not having a miss. We have enjoyed every game we played by them quite a bit. And I'm really looking forward to reviewing that one. But the reason I haven't unboxed is I have another package coming. This one from Czech Games Edition, which is an update to a classic game I love at a new lower price point. I don't know if you know exactly what game I'm talking about, but you may not, may or may not. And I don't want to spoil it. So you may have to turn in, tune in next week to hear what that is. So the whole thing is I have to show up because I don't want to setting up an unboxing is a pain in the butt in this room. So I don't want to set it up and do the one unboxing. And then like tomorrow, the other game shows up on my porch. So I'm waiting for both to show up. And then at the same time on Sunday, I unboxed this, which is a copy of this didn't happen, which is a time travel card game. that looks pretty cool, but there's no rules in here. And I'm like, Oh, what the heck? There's no rules. So I contacted the designer And they're like, oh, we ship those separate from a separate company. So this is one of those things you deal with when dealing with prototypes that they ordered this and then they ordered that and they're both going to get to me at different times. So I'm looking forward to trying this. So this is on my list to play. I really do want to try it, but until the rules show up, I'm kind of stuck. So we're waiting for that to show up. So that, again, is depending on what shows up. So as for stuff I don't have to wait for, 
there's roll camera. So that's the big one is, is assuming this other stuff doesn't show up. I want to get roll camera played. I would love to review that next week though. If Sean can make it down anytime soon, I might push that out a bit, but I don't know nah, too long. All right. I was going to say, if it's a couple weeks, I could probably push it out and we can keep talking about games off my personal pile of shame, but I do want to get that review out there. We, we, we have, uh, we've had it for long enough and it's, I, I want people to know about it because right now it's on Kickstarter for a reprint. I, believe, so I would love to get that review done before the unless unless, unless there's an online version. My work is just killing me. So, all right, because I think Sean, in particular, with the with the lighting expertise and having been at on sets, not necessarily film sets, but oh, been, no, on I've been on sets. film sets. Oh, there you go. You've been <laughs> on film sets. Would definitely dig the theme of this game. Mm. We'll have to look and see if there is an online version. There is one for Land versus Sea, so we technically could start playing that one without playing the physical copy. But I don't want to get any content out until the unboxing is out there first. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Kevin Reno, thank you, Tech, and I hope you're not going to be affected by the latest news from the Windsor Assembly Plant. Timothy Smith, Timothy Smith. thanks, Timothy. Captain Tori, you're coming over Friday. We've been treating you to all the good food. We, we, we introduced them to Greek Boy Bureaus last week. So what are we doing this week? What are we doing for interesting food this week? William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, thank you, as always, for joining us in the chat room and your continued support, our Major Kayla. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and Ryan's not here, so I think we got to leave the portcullis open because he seems to be running late. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, you can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates, links down below, and leave a like, a rating, or a comment wherever you find us. Scribes are nice, we like those. Ding the bell so you get notified so you don't miss us. All those awesome things you can do to make us feel good about the content we're providing. The final thing you can do, though, which is even better, is you can go to patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and support us financially through there, which we would greatly appreciate. I just used some Patreon funds today to do a invisible background upgrade, which hopefully you'll never have to hear about by purchasing a new UPC for my PC because my old one died this afternoon. And there was a good chance we weren't even going to record tonight due to electrical issues. So that got fixed. That's a background thing. You're probably not going to see, but it does mean that if the power goes out, we can stay live now. You also get access to other awesome stuff. Like I just, for free RPG day, decided to send everyone a copy of my latest role-playing game before anyone else in the world got to see it, as well as access to our Discord channel and other cool patron-only bonuses, including usually like two hours at least of bonus audio. Now, before we go, one more quick shout out to our sponsor, Crowd Games, with a capital C and a capital D. Be sure to check out City of the Great Machine on Kickstarter. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. And stop by Sundays for Brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.